coming from Miami Beach is Dr. John Bennett. It gives me great honor to welcome. I'm chairing a, a huge um, educator in the neurosurgery field, always ready to teach, uh, and we'll let Ahmed run the proceedings. So, good day, Ahmed. Could you please introduce yourself and <clears throat> on you go? Hi, dear John. Uh, this is Ahmed Al Ghanmi, the president of Walter E. Dandy Neurosurgical Student Club of Yemen. I'm also an officer in Abdur Rahman University of Neurosurgery, which is considered the first online academic degree in neurosurgery worldwide. I am so pleasure and honored to welcome and to introduce Prof. Ayub Churian uh, to get uh, a lecture uh, entitled with um, CSF and ventricular system. Hi, dear Prof. Thank you very much, Ahmed. It's an honor. Are you uh, are you able to hear me properly? Yes. Okay, yeah. John, I'm going to share my screen right now. Can you see my screen? Yes, it's not full screen yet. Yeah, perfect. It's okay? Yes, perfect. Right, so it's an honor to be talking to all of you guys. And... Uh, um, Today, I'll go a bit um, informal. So uh, we, we will have a, as John said, we'll have a discussion later as well. You know, about uh, 15 years back when I was a young neurosurgeon, I had finished from one of the most premier institutes in uh, Valor in India. I, of course, I wanted to be a skull base and vascular guy and because that was the most uh, fashion fashionable thing at that time. And then I went to uh, Japan. I was with Professor Sano. Um, he was my mentor. He still is my mentor and Professor Kato. And I, I learned the basics and uh, advanced uh, uh, vascular neurosurgery and skull-based neurosurgery there. Then I came back. I was uh, all about skull base and vascular till a small accident happened. So this is what I'm going to tell you about how this small accident changed my life. So I have told this to a lot of people. So it's about, you know, it was a weekend and there was, there were two cases. So I was asked by my junior consultant to come and help him for the aneurysm. There was one aneurysm and there was a trauma. So I was uh, asked by my junior consultant to come and help him with the aneurysm. So, you know, 15 years back, we didn't have these uh, fancy phones where you could send messages uh, of the NGO and, uh, you know, you could tell that this is the craniotomy that you require and all that. No. So I still remember the ambulance which came with the angiogram. So I, I looked at the angiogram. I was in a shopping mall. Um, so I looked at the angiogram and I th thought it's... Uh, it's a pretty good echo aneurysm. So let's go with it. And uh, I went in after one hour. Uh, there was one more trauma. So I asked this guy, we will do the trauma after the aneurysm. So I went ahead. Um, so the, the guy had al already opened the dura. The brain was very tense and angry. So in a tense aneurysm, generally we tend to open the optical carotid systems. We went subfrontally. It was a bit difficult, but we went subfrontal, opened the optical carotid system, then put in the, I mean, I put in the microscope there and then started dissecting the lateral carotid system, dissected a little bit of uh, the membrane of lilic pest, then went back. Uh, I was not confident of opening the membrane of lilic pest at that time. So I did not open it completely, but just went back and uh, opened uh, uh, the endohemispheric and started looking at the ACOM. For about one hour, I went and looked at the ACOM and there was no aneurysm. So I, you know, I panicked a bit. I told him, I told my assistant, I can't find the aneurysm. He said, this is not the aneurysm, this is the trauma. So I, I was angry. I was uh, upset, 
um i might have told him something that uh, right now i cannot translate uh, it's uh, not very correct but uh, what happened was that i suddenly realized that you know this is a brain trauma i have treated it just like an aneurysm i i was in fact i thought it was an aneurysm i didn't treat it like an aneurysm i thought it was an aneurysm and the brain was lax but i didn't put the bone flap back because my conditioning my conditioning was such that i i could not put the bone flap back i went back i took the bone flap off next day the bone the bo- the, brain, the the brain was completely lax the patient was pulling at the tube <laughs> and i thought and i thought you know this is fantastic if i start treating head injuries like this so i i started doing this this was what changed my life you know and that that journey started from that day in uh, 2006 sometimes or 2007 maybe 2007 uh, sometime so that's where our journey started so i made the mistake of treating a, a trauma as an aneurysm so i would tell you all of you guys to start doing the same but you should know how to operate an aneurysm so that's what i'm going to tell you okay and i'm going to tell you why this happened and then i'm going to tell you what what did we think and what how we progressed after that you must understand i was in nepal for 14 years we didn't have any basic science research facilities i had just about the same facilities that you had maybe a little bit more later on as we progressed but uh, i didn't have any basic science research facilities so i want to tell you the biggest lab is this your mind okay and if you have a child like wonder and you have the ability to ask why is everything happening the way it's happening and question everything not listen to everything that every other say and you know and have the strength to go and you know go and break 100 year old beliefs even even when people will laugh at you they'll mock you if you have the ability to do that then doesn't matter where you are it could be in iraq iran indonesia south america india anywhere you would win okay there's no question about it this this slide is very important to me because i i remember going and meeting asigil and talking to him about cystinostomy and uh, he made some very kind and very nice comments uh, on this consistonostomy uh, it, it was very nice initially he was very nasty to me but then after i explained to him he was so impressed and he was very kind and he told me that when we started microneurosurgery the initial response was nasty terrible people said we doing everything without a microscope why have something which which is so difficult and doesn't provide anything much better this is what the comments were initially but you see today microneurosurgery is a completely different thing thank god there were not a lot of these publishers at that time i'll tell you something about publishing okay again this is informal i told i told you i today i wanted to be a bit informal um everybody has their perspectives my perspective is that unless a neurosurgeon learns to operate very well he shouldn't go into the field of publishing this is my perspective uh i see a lot of young boys being led to believe that publishing makes them better no does it we are a country i mean in india we are a country where we have 1.2 billion population and we need neurosurgeons to operate 
it is the same or it is much more in Africa, South America. You take five, six of the world. We, we need neurosurgeons to operate, not sit and publish. No, that's not what we got the degree for. We must learn microneurosurgery, but that is tough. That is not easy as publishing. It is publishing is a, is a easy way of getting into you know journals and getting your promotions and uh, that's that's an easy way. This is my perspective. I I can tell you you may differ with it, but this is my perspective. But if you want to do an aneurysm properly, it'll take you five years. If you want to do it rather very good, it'll take you 10 years or 15 years. And it is, this life is filled with heartbreaks. It's heartbreak after heartbreak after heartbreak after heartbreak. Very little to cheer for. And, you know, very little luck sometimes. Everything that can go wrong sometimes goes wrong. It's not an easy journey. It's a thankless job, but still, this is what we are called for. This is what we must get good at. And this is exactly what will make the change, will make the change. And if you settle back to your comfort zones, publishing the surgeries that you're never doing, looking at the data where there's not really any work, you go back to what Europe is doing right now. Let me tell you, English neurosurgery, I don't think Victor Hosley would be very proud of English neurosurgery right now. I'm not, um, you know, I'm, I'm not generalizing. But generally, something like what Victor Hosley did once he started, something that he started. Uh, give me a second, guys. Uh, give me a second. Atul, I'm giving a lecture. Yeah, sure. So, you know, this is not what we, we are going to be, the young neurosurgeons of you today. You can publish only after you are good enough to clip any aneurysm. To you take you good enough to do any spine. You're good enough to, to tackle any skull-based tumor. After that, you start publishing. You start publishing before you have a problem. Why? Because we are a set of people who has a set of skills. We're not every Tom, Tom, Dick and Harry. So we have a set of skills and that set of skills must be so much that it must be considered like wizardry. It'll be, it should be considered like magic. When you're operating, people should think, ah, this guy knows his trade. Should not be like... Uh, a uh, guy who's come from the streets and who's who's doing uh, uh, something for the first time. No. And Byron was talking about cadaver lab. This is so important. Spend your nights, your days in the cadaver lab. Understand anatomy. Start anastomosing. Get skills. Push it. And then you will start understanding the pleasure of neurosurgery. So this search, this I want to tell you the last sentence Hugo Cranbull in 1966 said, gentlemen, I give you the surgery of the future. So get a microscope, all of you. You know, I have a young Dominican fellow who couldn't afford a microscope, who made an industrial exoscope, a 2D exoscope. And he's operating with that and he's sending me videos. So where there is a will, there is a way. There has to be a will, okay? There has to be a will. Get an exoscope. Get just a camera that can uh, 
you know, get 10x Zoom, 2D even, get it and start operating. It's cheap, okay? You know, we're going to have an innovation section in Rio and I'm chairing it, for innovation section for the World Skull Base Conference. And these, you are the guys I want to see, okay? Innovating, throwing out, you know, I'm talking for Zais for the National Conference, but I'm telling you, you should throw out all these companies. You should, okay? By making innovative products which your country can afford. Our countries can afford and we make something. You know, we should start the innovations instead of sitting and publishing and looking at p-values, okay? I'm not against publishing. I'm, I don't say publishing is a bad thing, but we, what we need right now is advancement of surgical technique and innovative thinking. So I'm going to ask you, can brain trauma benefit from microneurosurgery? surgery? You know, it is the only branch which is still in the dark ages. And because we have lots of it, the low and middle income countries have lots of it. UK doesn't have a lot of it. Okay. There, an entire hospital, an entire hospital would not be doing enough trauma like a small city hospital here. Okay, my resident would do more trauma than all the so-called trauma surgeons from the West. My residents would do. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. I mean, it's the same for you in South America. It's the same for you in uh, uh, Middle East or Africa or anywhere. And these are the guys who make policies and tell us how to do trauma. And uh, we stand like this and uh, admire them when they... Uh, what is the use of all these journals? I ask you, again, I ask you, what is the use of all these journals when there is social media? It is because people don't trust each other. That is the whole p-value thing, you know, because you have to prove something. Why do you have to prove? Because you don't trust each other. Why don't we trust each other? Because there's no more integrity. We are not kind. We are not magnanimous. We don't think about others. We publish anything, whatever whatever, if there is no control, we publish whatever, okay? That should not be the, that should not be the case, okay? Unless you are a good neuro, unless you are a good person, you cannot be a good neurosurgeon. Always remember that. And there's no need for the guys who are controlling all these journals to tell you what to do. With your common sense and with, with your knowledge of what has been going on in neurosurgery, Look at the history of how Dandy, how Cushing, how all these guys started. They didn't have anything, okay? They still did a lot of cases which, you know, 80% of the cases that you're doing today, they could do it, okay? Drake was doing basilar aneurysms without a microscope, without a microscope, okay? Drake and Peerless, we had Yuha with us for an year. And they were saying, he was saying to me, I couldn't believe it. Drake and Peerless, they were doing basilar tip aneurysms without, aneurys without a microscope. And their mortality is better than most of the guys today. Remember that. So don't think that you don't have anything. You have everything. And what you, what you have yourself is a, you are a neurosurgeon. Okay, remember that. I'm going to tell you a few things about CSF dynamics. I'm not going to go into the, you know, the nitty gritties of it. I only want you to understand one thing. You have brain and the brain is suspended in CSF. This is your classical teaching. All the while you've been learning that. The brain is suspended in a 120 ml of CSF, isn't it? What is the CSF doing other than just suspending the brain? Do you know that the CSF is changed three times every day? Why, why is that CSF changed three times every day? And do you think the CSF goes into the brain at all? So these were the questions we had when Sister Nosmi started working. Because if you see a scan after two hours after trauma, there is no CSF. All the cisterns are obliterated. 
Every system is obliterated. And the brain is swollen. And when you ask neurosurgeons, why is the brain swollen and why is the system not seen? You know what is their answer? They say the brain is compressing the systems. You, land, you will hear this answer a lot more times than you expect. That's because we don't know. We don't know. I mean, I should say we don't know shit about physics, but I wouldn't say that. We don't know anything about physics. That's why the brain cannot compress 100 ml of CSF. It's impossible. Just impossible. Okay? So what you need to understand is if you ask a child, there's a sponge and there's a lot of water, suddenly the sponge expanded and there's no water. Where did the water go in? You will say the water went into the sponge. And is the brain a sponge actually? Yes, it is. The sponge has multiple pores going th throughout the length and breadth of it. Exactly what the brain has. The virtual robin spaces from the cisterns are around the vessels and they go all through the brain. And when there is traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, you see that? That is a cistern, that's a vessel, and that's a virtual robin spaces. So the brain is actually like a sponge. The brain is like a sponge. So you have water and the brain is suspended there suddenly there is there is bleeding into this space and what happens the pressure there goes up and so what happens to the water the water goes into into this the vr spaces the water goes into the vr spaces and that is why the brain swells up. We call it CSF shift edema. It is proven now. We said that water goes into the Vashrobin spaces. It was, there was no proof in 2007, 2012. Glymphatic system paper came from Netagard and they live and they, they, they proved it. So we at that time, when we were talking, we didn't have any basic proof. Excuse me. I, yeah. So this is a glymphatic system. So that is the cisterns. And those are the vessels. And around the vessels, you can see the CSF going in to all parts of the brain. So when you imagine you have bleeding there, this CS, this cisterns will disappear because they would have discharged into this brain and the brain will be edematous. And it's called CSF shift edema. So how do you address it? How do you, how do you address it? Addressing it is not opening a large hole at the top that will cause this edematous brain to bulge out. On the other hand, if you go open the cisterns and let out all the blood, what will happen? The CSF will shift back. You can actually see CSF flowing back. Once you open out all the cisterns, you can see that the CSF comes in slowly. You need skull-based technique for that. You need to learn that, of course. Okay, But I'm sure... The people in your country who, who's doing aneurysms, they have the adequate knowledge for that. You should catch them. The problem is they never come to do trauma. And the guys who do trauma are mostly guys who, you know, I'm not generalizing in our countries, but mostly the Western so-called so big trauma neurosurgeons are mostly data collectors. They are data collectors. I don't know why they still call themselves neurosurgeons. Um, I'm being inflammatory again, but uh, every time, every time I press this, I, I tell them that when you tell them about skull-based technique, they tell you about the technique of doing decompressive. I tell them always that you need more technique to milk a cow in my farm than 
to do decompressive hemicrinectomy. There's no technique there. But to do an aneurysm surgery, you need technique. Okay? So that's what you guys have to learn. All right? Don't listen to these chaps who tell you about technique of decompressive. All right? So <laughs> I'm sorry, but decompressive hemicrinectomy, I don't believe that. And then you add something called hinge craniotomy. I, I really don't believe in that. It's just an extension of decompressive, okay? You should learn aneurysm surgery. Forget cystinostomy, forget everything. You learn how to go into the systems, open the systems, clip aneurysms, and then things will come automatically, okay? Now, we started figuring why, did, why does the CSF have to go into the brain at all? And then we are figured that actually CSF is probably cooling and cleaning the brain. It is actually cooling and cleaning the brain. We didn't have evidence at first. Now we have lots of it. And again, one more thing. How is the CSF driven into, into the Verscherobin spaces? That's even more interesting. We thought it's capillary action. No, it's not. Turns out that the vascular pulsations drive it in. What a beautiful mechanism. What an amazing mechanism. I got this idea when I went to see Leonardo da Vinci's museum in Tours. You know, the WFNS Masters holds their uh, uh, courses in Tours. And I was there as faculty once. And I went to Leonardo da Vinci Museum. I saw Archimedes screw. And I suddenly realized that's exactly the way the, 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 the CSF gets pumped into the brain with the arterial pulsations, okay? This is how the arterial pulsations travel as a wave and that's how CSF is pushed in, all right? And what is the need for the CSF being pushed in? I'm gonna tell you about the cooling first, okay? So, before I tell you about the cooling, people tell me sometimes, why didn't you put in an inter, I mean, extra, uh, why didn't you put in an intraventricular catheter, external ventricular drain? Doesn't work because the ventricular CSF is a production phase. Production. It's being produced there. It's not communicating with your parenchyma. So, you see here, they put ventricular dye and after half an hour that dies nowhere nowhere in the brain but they put cisternal dye and within half an hour it's everywhere in the brain so it is the cisternal csf that is communicating with the parenchyma not the ventricular ventricular okay so when you put a ventricular drain you're just playing with the compliance of the brain the very highly tense brain the compliance curve is very steep. So you take out some 2 ml of CSF, you will bring down the pressure, but that's not going to help you, okay? That's not really going to help you. So a ventricular drain is no way equivalent to a cysternal drain, okay? So next time somebody asks you that, answer that question, okay? This is a Elif talking about how the CSF moves very fast. This is available on YouTube. How, how CSF moves very fast into the brain. This is about their paper. So this is CSF shift edema that I talked to you about, okay? How the CSF gets shifted into the brain. And so this is an animation I made many, many years back and I still stick with it. So these are the systems. You have VR spaces into the brain. So the brain is like a sponge. I told you it's the VR spaces are all over. And when you have bleeding in the systems, the pressure goes up. The blood cannot go through the VR spaces, you see, because it's too, the, the RBCs are too big for VR spaces, okay? So the blood cannot go. What goes in? The cistern and CSF. The CSF goes in, all right? So the brain expands and there's, the cisterns are not, not seen at all. So we got 
when we talked about this for the first five years, people laughed at us. People said, no, it's, this is not going to be working. Or, everything new. Believe me, if one of you brings something new to the world, you're going to be laughed at first. Okay? Most of the guys quit at that time. They say, they say why should I be laughed at? You know, the most important thing that one needs is respect. More than money, more than anything. One needs is respect. You don't have respect, then it's a bit of a problem, all right? So people will laugh at you. Believe me, I am warning you. Okay, you bring something new, people are going to laugh at you first. And after that, they're going to come against you with evidence. They say, you have no evidence because you're from Nepal, you're from India, you're from, uh, you're from Yemen or you're from South America. You don't have anything. Okay, and we're going to tell you how it's this is done, but we had a lot of good friends and my good friend, Garnet Sutherland, he did this experiment to prove CSF shift edema and we were able to prove with the weight uh, with the seven Tesla MR, you can see the MR in the background, that's a seven Tesla MR and we were able to prove this, it's a fantastic experiment and we, we proved CSF shift edema with this experiment, okay? So what is the remedy? The remedy is not decompressive hemicrinectomy. It's a hundred year old surgery, which is wrong, which is a wrong surgery. There have been so many trials. Um, so they all talk about why decompression hemi decompressive hemicrinectomy doesn't work, that it doesn't work, but anything new comes, they all stand up. No, this needs randomized controlled trial. This needs this trial, that trial. I mean, how many randomized controlled trials were done before decompressive hemicrinectomy was accepted? How many randomized controlled trial was done before a drill in surgery was accepted? How many randomized controlled trial was done before the clip in clipping was accepted? And God bless all those surgeons who didn't do randomized controlled trial and advanced neurosurgery through trials and tribulations instead of sitting and writing something. Okay, so they were the real path breakers. In, in, mid, in midway, we lost our way. And I want you young guys to say that you publish only after you become masters in neurosurgery, okay? So learn how to let out CSF. Learn how to do aneurysm surgeries and then analyze. analyze. Analysis is like becoming coaches. You know, the best players in the world after they are retired, they, they go to coaching. That's the analysis job, all right? But they don't become coaches in the beginning, right? When you're 24, 25 years old, you don't become coaches, right? So analysis is for the coaches, okay? You, you're the players, okay? Play. So cystinostomy by definition is letting out CSF from the basal system, basal systems. There's nothing new. It's been practiced known for 50 years from Yasegil's times. Everybody knows that in aneurysm surgery, you let out the CSF and you will reduce the pressure. Same thing. Nothing, nothing big, nothing small. It is the same thing. You do the same thing in trauma. It's a bit more challenging because trauma brain is a little bit more bulging. But there is a fear. How is that fear caused? Because generations of neurosurgeons open the brain from top. Obviously, when you have, when you have so much pressure and you open the brain from top, People call it brain fungus. People call it malignant brain swelling. But go to the base, you'll find it. Find the difference. Go to the base, retract a bit, get into the systems. People think it's impossible because you've been taught for generations it's impossible. It's not so. Okay, my junior consultants, the fellows who've been trained with me, and every other country. You ask Samir from uh, Iraq. You ask uh, uh, Vaiga and Alain from Brazil. Everywhere in the world, people are doing it right now, okay? They'll tell you this myth of so-called so malignant brain swelling is wrong, doesn't exist, 
Okay, it's just some kind of fear which has been instilled into you by generations of neurosurgeons who practices this 100 year old surgery. So that is CSF shift edema. That's a concept. Cystinostomy, we go and open the cisterns and reverse this gradient. And you see decompressive. With that kind of edema, you open this and you allow this brain to swell out. And you say that is salvage procedure. Believe me, that is converting a cemetery to a vegetable market. Okay? If that is somebody who is very unkind who told me uh, that I that that thing stuck, but they they said it is the reality. You are converting a cemetery to a vegetable market. Okay, not not very useful. Okay, and everybody will tell you that. Everybody. Okay, everybody who's done decompressives will tell you you you've done a lot of decompressives. You know that it's not useful. Okay. The decompressives which are useful in subdural hematomas, where these are cases where you really didn't de need decompressives at all. And believe me, right now, it's such a win-win situation for everybody because the residents get to do something, the consultant gets to sleep, the companies get to put their titanium meshes, and all the, uh, all this, all the uh, meetings and the journals are sponsored by these companies. And the so-called trauma surgeons, they become big by just collecting data and presenting p-values and, uh, you know, present it in a rosy manner and you get to be a big guy, okay? So, and present some studies, uh, analyzing the results of what residents did. Residents, okay? So most of these trauma surgeons, they, they don't get into the theater. Okay, you ask them that, how do you open the system? They have absolutely no idea because, I mean, they made their incompetence into a career, you see? That, that is, so don't follow them. Don't follow them. The guy in your, in your hospital who does the aneurysm surgery, who's not well published, I'm sure thousands of those guys are there. Follow them. Don't follow the guys from the West. Go, to your, go, go back to your hospital and see who's the guy who's doing aneurysms. Tell him, see, listen, I want you to help me with opening the cisterns, okay? That guy will say, no, I'm not coming to trauma. He said, no, I want you to come for trauma. I want you to come and help me opening the cisterns. Do a decompressive hemicrinectomy at first, but go and open the cisterns and see the difference, okay? And when that guy can help you, that guy can help you much, much more than any of your so-called trauma neurosurgeons who publish in the Bible journals and all that, okay? No, 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 that's not what you want, all right? My screen's getting stuck. Okay, so these are some of the concepts that'll help you to get into the system. So this is called sagittal unlocking, this is called axial unlocking. We have published this so many times the steps. Uh, let me tell you one more thing. I was very stupid because I was a uh, skull base surgeon. I'm still a skull base surgeon. So I was very stupid. I thought that we need transcavernous uh, route. We need to take out the anticlinal process. We need, uh, you know, we need a lot of skull base work to open the systems. But the guys who did cystinostomy like Roy from Switzerland, Wang from China, Parthiban from India, Dr. Weiger from Brazil, Samir from Iraq, the Iran, Iranian guys, they all said there's no need for that. You don't need to do such a complicated thing. So I initially told them, no, 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 no. I described it. You better follow the way I, I tell you to do. So they said, no, you don't need to do all this. You just have to do some good sphenoid bridge work open subfrontally and you get into the systems. They were right, okay, I was wrong. So I still, my residents follow them, not me actually. So although I started it, my technique was, uh, you know, I would say in an extremely tight brain, maybe it's a bit useful to, 
to follow skull based technique but 99% of the times you don't need anti reclinectomy you don't need post reclinectomy you don't need transcavernous dissection you don't need anything okay just open lateral subfrontal you get into the optic now wash out and then you know you done and then you can go open each cisterns and membrane of the liquids later on okay so i was wrong there i was uh, stupid and silly because you know i was not willing to change now i know it can be done so all these guys like Wang, Partib, and Roy, I should give them the credit for simplifying cystinostomy and getting it to spread. Otherwise, I would have been the only guy talking about orbitomeningeal band resection, PCP resection, all that uh, for you know for years and years, and nobody would be doing it in trauma. So, well, these are the steps. So uh, these are my steps. I don't want you to follow my steps. You should, uh, I mean, there are so many videos of this announcement by Partib and by Roy, by Wang. So you should get to see one of these videos. Um, there is a systematic group, WhatsApp group, and uh, maybe you can get my WhatsApp number. You can get introduced to that group. And there's a lot of videos being posted on these groups. And um, I, I, you should see those, okay? Now, as far as the clinical outcomes are, I want you to ask you, can you see this scan? This is one of our very early scans, okay? Can you see how bad it is? So much edema, cisterns are not seen at all. There are contusions all over the place, okay? I don't even know what you're going to do here. Maybe uh, left-sided decompressive, but then the right side is also really edematous, you see? Okay, left-sided decompressive is probably what you're going to do, a large decompressive on the right, left side. All right, so what we did is we were doing a decompressive with cisternostomy for some time. And then after that, we started putting a thin sliver of bone. And that was the time this was, okay? And you can see the thin sliver of bone there. That's a bone, the thin sliver of bone there. That's muscle, okay, that's muscle. You see the difference? The difference here is that all the cisterns have opened up. Everything is opened up. So much contusions and all that. How do you expect this guy to be? And this is how he is. All right. I wish I could play the video. Oh, this is the guy who's talking. I'm asking him his name. He's talking and he's telling us his name and it's the same guy. It's a bit difficult to believe because uh, you should start seeing these results. And, you know, initially we were so astounded by the results. I started fighting with all the guys who's doing decompressive. I told them it's nonsense, but maybe I was a bit wrong because there's a, there are some cases where systemostomy will not help. And I'll tell you about that as well. Now you see this case, see the midline shift, see the contusions, see the subdural. This and see the CP angle system, it's, it's so widened and you can see the parahippocampal gyrus herniating already. This is as bad as it comes. And you see after the surgery, okay, no decompression. Bone is kept back, all right? This is the guy, okay? Before he's discharged from the ICU even. See this one. VVIP patient, no cisterns at all, tight brain, came with the GCS of six, M4, left people dilated, tentorial herniation, okay? 15 by 15 after, I mean, it's extubated in four days, but 15 by 15 afterwards, residual hemiparesis, cranial nerve, third palsy, now completely okay. Another one, see this one, how bad is the edema? How bad? Four, GCS of four, M2, bilaterally fixed the pupil. Immediately after the surgery, the patient came. You can see that white, white discolorations within the brainstem. One would think it's direct hemorrhages, okay? You see how much, how much we had to strive to get into the systems, you see? That's retraction injury. But see her. That's what I want you to see. See her. She's leading a completely normal life now, okay? And if you did a decompressive, you should have been dead. I can be sure of that. See another one. How bad is the subdural? 
How bad is the midline shift? See, the CP angle system is widened here, indicating that she's going to herniate right away. Okay, she's already herniating. This is before she was discharged. She came walking to my walking into my office. Another one. She show you so many of these. This is uh, uh, from Czech Republic showing the ICP drop from 48 to 11 during surgery. Another, another case, more. So my point here is that micro neurosurgery has come into all parts of other neurosurgery. And trauma is the biggest load in LMICs. In our country, trauma is the biggest load. Do it properly. You don't have to stand as a resident or like a fellow watching other surgeries, going to uh, you know, the West and standing there like a resident, standing there and watching their microneurosurgery. There's no need. You do microneurosurgery in this trauma, the, your patients would be benefited and you'll be masters. Do that, okay? It'll take some soul searching. It, it is a paradigm shift. It's, I would call it a leap of faith, okay? Come to us if you want, scrub with us, train with us, and after that, go back, do the surgery. Otherwise, go to your regional guys, okay? Um, and learn how to do aneurysm surgeries. That is enough. So um, there are indications. These are all published in World Neurosurgery. There's so many publications from the Swiss group, Chinese groups, Iraq groups, from us, from Parthibans group. So there are many, many publications. So the important question is, can trauma benefit from microneurosurgery? Yes. And can the world benefit from microneurosurgery? Yes. For trauma, microneurosurgery, yes. Stop decompressives, okay? Stop it. It's, I wouldn't, I would say, I wouldn't uh, refrain from saying it's criminal, okay? It's an old surgery. It's right now, at this point of time, doing it is criminal. It's like uh, putting holes to let out the spirits and all that, like few years, I mean, few thousands of years back, we were doing that, all right? So it was normal at that time. Shamans could do it at that time, no more. Decompressives are like that. Anybody who's uh, telling you you should do decompressives, you're close to that, okay? Don't do a 100-year-old surgery. We have the facilities. And don't believe that you cannot do anything because there's a lack of microscope, all right? Don't be sitting around like a duck somewhere. That's not what you are, all right? You raise horses, okay? Go do things, guys. And one more thing. After we figured out the CSF was going in, we also figured, we thought that you see the sinuses, you are all, these are all the sinuses. And the sinuses, what it does is they are lined with wet mucosa. And when you breathe in, this air cools the sinuses, like you wear a sweaty t-shirt and you sit under the fan, you get cool. The sinuses are getting cool. And the sinuses, this, this largest cistern is right in the center of these sinuses. And the CSF, the cool CSF is pumped into the rest of the brain. So when you're breathing, and when your vessels are pulsating, your brain is being cooled. See what a beautiful design it is. Okay? God or whoever it is or nature or evolution or whoever it is. See what a beautiful design it is. Intelligent design. Okay? We described that for the first time. So now that's in spring and nature. Now it's accepted. In fact, when you're intubating a patient, you're taking off this mechanism. When you're intubating a patient, you're taking off this mechanism. And that part is called shunting and you increase the brain temperature by 1.5 to 2 degrees, all right? So remember that. 
intubation for a long time is not probably a good thing to do, all right? This is the Springer textbook with our chapter. Intech also has our chapter. And I'm going to play a small, I always do this because I, I love this, okay? So while I can understand that the saying that the pen is mightier than the sword, for us, the surgical blade is mightier than the sword. That is our dictum, not the pen. We are not writers, okay? we are surgeons. Thank you. God bless. Hey, Ahmed. Ahmed, do you want to? Take over. Hi, I'm uh, hearing you. You hear me? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Prof. Ayyab for this fascinating and great lecture. And, uh, you know, uh, Professor Salim Abdurraouf uh, sent me a few minutes before of this lecture and told me to thank you for being with us and presenting us this great lecture. Okay, I want to just thank uh, Professor uh, Baron Salazar for being with us and attending this lecture. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. More comments from the uh, panelists, please. Just step up, don't be shy. S somebody's asked me about the MC infarction. Uh, Lawl of cystinostomy. See, I I had no experience because all these cases come to us after malignant brain edema sets in. So we started doing them and it didn't work. So we stopped it in 2007. But for the last three years, there's a group in Italy who's doing it early, quite early, which means after the time for mechanical thrombectomy salvage and intraarterial injections are over, they go ahead and do cystinostomy. So, and they have been getting excellent results. So, um, this Italian group has excellent experience and Shabarish Natarajan, so he's a Laligam Shegas fellow. He's also doing a lot of these uh, early cystinostomies and their results are fantastic. So, I don't have much experience, but for sure, uh, I can connect you to Shabarish and I can connect you to uh, the Italian guys. And then they are doing phenomenal work with the, uh, MC infarctions and uh, with cystinostomy. Okay, Manuel, hi, welcome. Hello, John. How are you? How are you doing? You want to? Uh, you didn't say. You want to make a comment, Ty? <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, say congratulations to Professor Cherian for his exposition. As Professor Cherian was saying, like we need to be in the operation room. Uh, all the time, 
I was in uh, when I was in in Karat with him. I learned the cystonostomy, and until now, uh, we have 22 cases of cystonostomy. I receive a lot of questions about cystonostomy because people. The first of all, as Professor Chirian says, if you don't understand the basic, of course you don't gonna understand. A lot of people are still very old people in, in this field ask me, but I can use a, a ventricular drainage. And I look with this face like, <laughs> but it's 20 milliliters. And as Professor Cheran explained, if we don't understand the function of the visual rubbing space and what happened there, there is no way out. So there is a lot of paradigm we need to change. And one, again, I congratulate Professor Cheran because he's trying to change this game uh, to say in, 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 in war, this game. And if we can take this cystonostomy to the, not only to the, to the low income country, to all over the world, because I see the result. And we are watching the result of the cystonostomy in the patients. And until now, uh, I showed to Professor Cherian because I received a lot of, you know, barriers here. First, the drill. And a lot of place, places, first the drill. Second, the microscope. And now we are getting different parts, different parts, because this isn't reality. Cystonostomy uh, came to stay. And if you don't want to accept it or learn it now, one day you need to, and it's gonna become a basic part of the cystonostomy. And when you say, I don't use cystonostomy, people gonna look at you like, you are in the cave time or what? So thank you so much, Professor, again, for motivating all of us with the cystonostomy. Thank you all. Thank you, Manuel. And I'm really proud of you. I am proud of the way you are doing with the exoscope. And uh, in, even in resource-limited countries, you are proving that the third world is in your mind. There's no third world. Third world is only in your mind. OK? We are the leaders, all right? because we have the patience, we will have the experience if we do the right things, okay? No more third world, we are the first world. When it comes to this kind of surgeries and things, we have the skills, we have the attitude, we can struggle and survive. So this is what you're showing and I'm proud of you, okay? Thank you, thank you so much, Professor. I, I think Harshad has a comment. Welcome Harshad, you wanna make that comment? Hi, John. How are you doing, welcome. Good, good. Hi, I. Hello, Harsha. Good to Hi, see you. And actually, yeah, yeah, good to see you. I've heard you so many times about cystinostomy, and every time you bring up something new. And nice of you to bring up this topic. My comment was uh, for the MCA. In fact, somebody was asking. And I'm doing it very regularly, very regularly. And uh, believe me, it has changed the results into the simple decompression versus the cystinostomy. Even in the, uh, in fact, and I agree, malignant uh, brain edema when it sets in, the results are not good. And usually we avoid operating on those cases. We, these cases are being sent to us by the neurophysician and it is on their whims and whims when to operate and not to operate. So, but the results are fantastic with the cisternostomy. I leave a drain there, uh, ventricular drain, EVD, and drain the CSF every day. And three, four days we drain, and the re results are really phenomenal. So, in my experience, yes, in MC or IC, in fact, it does work. It really helps to reduce the swelling. That's what I want to say. Thank you, Harshad. So you're probably doing it early. That is what you are doing. Uh, and also, somebody, uh, Byron had asked, uh, what is the size of the standard craniotomy? We do a large craniotomy. Okay, uh, we do a large craniotomy because it's uh, it's uh, standard. I mean, you know, there was a time when we started doing small supraviral craniotomies for cystinostomies, but the problem is um, that cannot be a standard. So, as a standard, we do a large frontotemporal craniotomy and we uh, do a lot of drilling the sphenoid ridge and uh, go lateral subfrontal and open the systems. Okay. Yeah, I call it a hemicranotomy. Yeah. 
Okay, Yao, Christian, you had a comment? Go ahead, Yao, unmute. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, John. Thank to Professor Sherian for this uh, such a great lecture. Great lecture. I've uh, followed you only once about this. This is the, the second time I'm listening to your lecture, and it's it been really a great, great pleasure. And uh, so far, hey, we are still doing at this point in our place over here. We are still doing this. Uh, some two years ago, no surgery has just you just said now. We are still doing this kind of. Uh, the compressive kind of told me we are still doing this uh, um, EVD and all those uh, old school stuff, <laughs> as you actually said. And while while I'm listening to you, uh, I just want to to pass through this screen and get get to your to, to, to your to, to, to your to your OR and and watch <laughs> learn from you. You know, this welcome. Is, this is great. You know, this is very nice. thank you very much for sharing this knowledge. And uh, I want the one one thing that I want is I don't know if you. Uh, is, is possible for us to join the um, is it WhatsApp group or a group where you share the video of the, the surgery? Or this thing? Yes, I will uh, share my number here. Okay. Uh, that, that'll be 00918518800. Uh, so that'll be my number. So uh, you can. Uh, Message me and I can put you into the WhatsApp group. Okay, message. great. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank yeah, you. Yao, where are you, where are you from, Yao? Where are you from? I'm from Benin Republic in, in West Africa. Okay, welcome. I'm uh, undergoing uh, some surgical training in Morocco and right now I'm in France. Doing, doing, uh, 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 I'm going undergoing this uh, fellowship in France. Okay, welcome. Thank you, sir. More comments, questions? Guys, I may have to log out soon. I am going in for something else, so I may okay. have to log out. Yeah, I, let, let, let's do a quick session of the uh, Neurosurgical TV lo Zoom Lounge, okay? Just so they can meet you, okay? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, let, let me let me let me go out for a second. I'll I'll come back in a, in a second, okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I put the link in your WhatsApp uh, page to come in, okay? Okay, I guess we can wrap it up. Uh, and you're all welcome to come to the after Zoom. Uh, the, the link, let me put the link in again. To, Ipe's gonna come and, uh, and Ahmed's gonna come and all, hopefully all the residents are coming and students too. It's gonna be private, not gonna be televised and not gonna be public. It'll be a private Zoom. Okay, so the link is there. I hope to see you all there. Okay? Okay, Ahmed? Yeah, I'm here. You. Okay, we'll see you there. Okay. I'm going to end this now. Okay. Get that link now. I'll give you another minute. Get that link. I'm going to shut I'm going to shut down this Zoom. So I'll give you a couple mm. of seconds to get that link. Okay. And we'll see you in a private Zoom. Uh, hopefully you guys will be more open. <laughs> okay, we're gonna end it here. Okay, see you over there. Bye. Yeah.